Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Thursday of the third week after the Epiphany. Thank you for being with me this morning. The scriptures we're using today are Psalm number 143. Uh, we're going to finish Genesis chapter 16 and catch the first half of chapter 17. And we'll continue where we left off in Hebrews, uh, starting chapter 10. <clears throat> so let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia! Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia! O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Okay. <clears throat> Psalm number 143. Lord, hear my prayer, and in your faithfulness, heed my supplications. Answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for in your sight shall no one living be justified. For my enemy has sought my life. He has crushed me to the ground. He has made me live in dark places like those who are long dead. My spirit faints within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the time past. I muse upon all your deeds. I consider the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul gasps to you like a thirsty land. O oh Lord, make haste to answer me. My spirit fails me. Do not hide your face from me or I shall be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for I put my trust in you. Show me the road that I must walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord, for I flee to you for refuge. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring me out of trouble. Of your goodness, destroy my enemies and bring all my foes to naught. For truly, I am your servant. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you bring the first light of dawn to those who dwell in darkness and make your love known to them. Enter not into judgment against your servants, but let your Spirit guide us into the land of justice, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign now and forever. Amen. All right, our first reading, Genesis chapter 16. We're going to read the last part of that chapter and the first 14 verses of, of chapter 17. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son 
whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abraham, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so so we finish the story of Hagar and Ishmael um, with the birth of Ishmael, and Abram follows the direction of the angel of the Lord and names her accordingly, names him Ishmael, which means God hears, okay? So he was 86 at that point. I think when we started that chapter, there was mention of him being 75. So some 11 years have transpired when Ishmael was born. That's pretty old by today's standards. Okay, so 13 years later, the Lord appears to him again. Let's just think about that. 13 years go by. We have no record of of God coming back to Abram. Did he speak to him? We don't know. Now, Abram was a man of great means. We know he had wealth. So he had many servants. I'm sure he was not bored. But he has been told by the angel of the Lord, and by God himself, that he would have a son. And it was not from anyone other than his wife, Sarai. Here's a son, but it's not according to God's word. It's not according to God's, God's promise. Sarai took matters into her own hands and found a way to give him a son in a different way. Not according to God's plan. Did not go well. Immediately there's strife between Sarai and her, and her maidservant. And that turns into strife between Sarai and Abram. It's just not a good thing. So God's promise has not been answered in the birth of Ishmael. That is not the child of the promise. So now he's 99. I don't know any 99-year-olds that are thinking about changing diapers and having a new baby running around that's not a great-great-grandchild, right? The Lord appeared to Abram. No, didn't just speak to him, appeared to him. This is important, okay? <clears throat> I 
All right. And we, it takes us back to chapter 12, verse 7. Okay. As we know, no one can look on God and survive. His holiness, his righteousness, and his glory would kill the average sinner. So, in verse 12, chapter 12, verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. Right? The Lord appeared to Abram. So, what's going on there? No one can see God and live, and no one has ever seen God. Those are both, uh, those are from Exodus and from 1 John 4 and 1 Timothy 6. It was not the Father who was seen, but the Son. He is the image of the invisible God. This is, again, the pre-incarnate Christ, Son of God. Okay? The only way God can appear, the Father cannot appear directly to a human. It had to be the Son, or it has to be a pillar of fire, or a pillar of cloud, or smoke in in the in the tent of meeting right it's not god it's it's god is in that smoke or whatever you know so but this this biblical scholars christian biblical scholars tell us these old testament appearances are the son not the father okay so he said to him, I am God Almighty. So this is not an angel. This is not an angel. Hebrew there is El Shaddai. You may have heard that before. If you haven't, there's a great song by Amy Grant, El Shaddai. One of the many titles that the Old Testament uses for Yahweh. Walk before me and be blameless. No pressure, huh? Um, yeah. What else did God want the, than that Abraham should continue in the righteousness and faith because of which he, sh he had been declared righteous and that he should be uncorrupted, blameless, and perfect? He is doing what God had expected of him. And God knows that Abram was this kind of man. And he wants him to continue to do this, to live his life this way, to walk this way. How That's how you live. Walk that way and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. God does not reward the unfaithful. God does not reward the disobedient. Just as a parent, you know, you didn't do your homework? Okay, well... Let's have some ice cream then. I'll go ahead and give you your reward. That's not how it works. In order for God to bless him the way he wants to, Abram needs to be the kind of servant of the Lord, the kind of follower of, of God that he needs to be so that he can be in a position to receive those blessings. So Abram fell on his face, position of worship. Okay, so God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Okay, we've heard this several times. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which means exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. Okay, this could be the father of just one. But as a father, and he's not a father yet. Well, he is to Ishmael, but he's not the father he has been told he would be. So changing his name is God's way of saying, you are going to have many. Now, maybe just one son, but many grandchildren. Or maybe just two grandchildren, but many great-grandchildren. That's where it really starts to get big, right? I have made you. Already done. It's a completed action. I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now that applies. That applies to Ishmael also. That will be he's his offspring will become many. But between Ishmael and the son to come, Isaac, he will be 
the father of millions. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Right? All the kings of Israel. All the proper kings, anyway. I will establish my covenant. God establishes it between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations, an everlasting covenant, right? This 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 is more than just until you, 99-year-old man, until you pass away. This covenant will last long after. I will keep my promise with your, with your children and your grandchildren and all those generations, everlasting. It will not stop to be God to you and your offspring after you. I'm your God and their God too. And I will give to you and them the land of your subject, everywhere you've journeyed, everywhere you've wandered, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. A lot of repetition. I'm your God. I'm their God. I'll be God to you and to them. You will receive the land that I promised, and so will they. They will own it forever. And he said to Abraham, as for you. So now he's going to say, okay, this is my part of the covenant. Now let's talk about your part. You're going to keep it, right? You and all your all your generations after you, everyone to follow, right? What are you going to do? You're going to keep a sign of the covenant by circumcising the male children, right? Right, and it goes into detail. This will be a sign of the covenant between me and you, right? You shall be circumcised. The baby can be eight days old. He who's eight days old among you shall be circumcised. So it's there's a day that it's to be performed. Right now, obviously, when he gets down into the servants, anyone you bought with money, you circum so there's going to be some adults. That's going to be unpleasant. Not that it's pleasant for the babies, but the babies don't <laughs> can't fight this much, right? So every male. Every male, whether born in your house or brought into your house, any foreigner, not of your offspring, whoever is part of your house shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Can't undo it, right? Even tattoos can be removed and covered up. You can't undo this, right? Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. If you're not going to do this, you are not going to receive my promise. Okay. Um, so it is a physical sign which illustrated the blood basis of the covenant and its intensely personal character. This is pretty intensely personal, and blood is involved. Okay. Skin is cut. Infant circumcision points to God's inclusion of his people in the covenant promise, even at a tender age. When you hear other Christians say, well, you, you shouldn't baptize babies, they can't make a choice. These babies didn't have a choice, but they still received the promise. Why would God change that? Right? God includes infants in his promise. It anticipated when circumcision would end and baptism would then become the sign of the new covenant. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. God finished the work of the original creation on the sixth day, and on the seventh day he rested. The eighth day represented a new beginning. That's where the eight days comes from. Christ finished the work of the new creation by redeeming us with his blood on the sixth day, Good Friday. The Sabbath, seventh day, he rested in the tomb. On Easter Sunday, the eighth day, Christ arose, starting the new creation. Right? Interesting. So, Abraham receives both a new name and a sign of the covenant promise that God gave his people. The Lord received the same sign of the circumcision, shedding his infant blood and receiving the name Jesus, proving himself to be our dear Savior, because Jesus, too, was a Jew, and he lived the law perfectly, even as an eight-day-old infant. He was still beholden to the law. Jesus never violated God's law. Even this, he received this covenant. <clears throat> okay. 
that's where we're going to stop for today in the Old Testament. We'll pick up with verse 15 tomorrow. All right, Hebrews 10. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. So, the last couple chapters, we've been talking about how the, the tent that Moses built, um, the tabernacle, as they called it, which was really, best way to think of it is a mobile temple. So, wherever the people went, as they wandered, God was still with them. <clears throat> because God's presence was with the Ark of the Covenant, which was... God instructed them to build a tent, so it would be there. They would know where it was. They would know where he was. The temple, then, was more of a permanent version of that tabernacle, okay? And as glorious and majestic as the temple that Solomon built was, it was but a shadow of what it was meant to represent. God's home, where he resides, is heaven. He would, his presence would be in the temple and in the tabernacle, but his home is heaven. And the tabernacle and the temple were just shadows, cheap copies of the real thing. Now, this language that, that the, the author of Hebrews uses for the covenants is similar. The old the old covenant, the law, has but a shadow or a cheap copy of the good things to come, right? The old covenant was not as good. And he's already said this a few times, but now he's saying it again, and he's going to use a, a, a different illustration here to clarify that. Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, okay? Let's see. Sacrifices foreshadowed Christ's own person and work. He was the best sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. Instead of the true form of these realities, the law can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, right? There's the law spells out you commit this sin, this is the sacrifice you must make. This is the sacrifice you must offer. You must do this. You must, this animal, this must be killed. This blood must be shed. This must be brought to the priest. But they're offered every year. And many people were offering the same sacrifices because they were making the same sins. So they do not make perfect those who draw near. They're not changing them. Okay? If they did, otherwise... Would they not have ceased to be offered? Okay, I committed this sin. I'm making this offering. 
I realize now that's a sin. My heart has changed. I'm not going to do that anymore. You don't make that sacrifice anymore. That sacrifice is no longer offered if your heart has changed. But because the worshipers, having been once cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. Okay, so if that sacrifice cleansed them, changed their hearts, then they wouldn't commit that sin anymore. And eventually, you would think they would, well, I committed that sin, made that sacrifice, I don't do that sin anymore. Okay, well, now I have a new sin. I don't, eventually you'd run out of sins, right? You wouldn't have to make those sacrifices anymore. There would be no more sacrifices to be made. But that's not what happened. In these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. And often it was the same sins. Why? Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They don't take them away from the sinner. The sins remain with us. All we've done is offered up the blood price of what those sins cost because of how they damage the relationship. The relationship between us and God for violating his law. As a result, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, God didn't just want, he, he didn't desire sacrifices and offerings. What a body have you prepared for me? Okay, now this is, see the quote? This is from Psalm 40, okay? Pardon me. Um, so, uh, verse 4 In, all right, this is talking about Leviticus 17, verse 11. Okay. Because, uh, yeah. Again, never take away sins. This, this, this is citing Leviticus 17, verse 11, which is where some of these sacrifices are, um, are explained. I'm not going to go to it now, but. Let's see. When Christ came into the world, he, uh, you, the Father, have not desired sacrifices and didn't want them, didn't want to have to receive them, didn't want people to sin where they needed to make sacrifices and offerings. But a body you have prepared for me. All right. This emphasizes that God... Um, all right, there's a whole long paragraph here. A person should commit himself to obeying God after hearing his word. Okay, this there's another phrase that this is borrowed from in the Greek that says, um, ears you have dug out or prepared for me, which emphasizes that God helps a person to hear his word. Uh, it's possible that the Greek manuscripts with body were taking ears to represent the whole person. In that case, a person would commit himself to God obeying to obeying God after hearing his word. But there is a similarity of the Greek letters for ears and body when they're tightly written. So this could be a variant in the in the text. Um, basically, this this line here. Only through faith in Christ were these sacrifices pleasing to God, right? And he wants. Um, that faith, we know that faith comes from hearing. And if this word is actually ear, yeah, um, you have prepared ears for me who would hear and in their hearing and faith would obey. That's what God wants. He wants obedience. He wants hearts that obey. You take no pleasure in burnt offerings and sin offerings. Some of God's creatures have to be killed for this. And they don't make a change in the sinner. They don't take away the sins of the sinner. So who's speaking here? This again, this is Christ. So Christ said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. To fulfill the law, to satisfy, satisfy God's justice, and to accomplish the redemption of the human race. That is doing God's will as seen by the Messiah. That's what he had to do, to fulfill the law, to satisfy God's justice, to accomplish the redemption of the human race. 
And when he said this, you haven't desired sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law. Those were required under the old covenant. He added, because you didn't want that, you don't take pleasure in that. Christ added, behold, I've come to do your will. So he does away with these to establish this, doing your will. Right? And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's the last sacrifice. That's the last sacrifice of blood. Now we offer a sacrifice of prayer and thanksgiving. Those are the sacrifices we're asked to make now. <clears throat> God's gracious will is expressed in the New Testament as a will or covenant. To be sanctified means our sins have been taken away. That is what Christ came to do, and he accomplished it. And we then are free to also strive to do God's will. All right, let's conclude. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Let us pray. Almighty God, who knows us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, grant us such strength as may support us, and ask of us such strength as you will yourself supply. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Thursday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day He's given to you. Uh, guess we'll be back here again tomorrow, same time. Hope you can join us for that. Uh, God willing, it'll be the same time. I <laughs> um, think we're doing better this week than last week. But um, yeah, your flexibility is always appreciated. So. Um, stay warm, stay dry, and uh, uh, I wish you a blessed rest of your day. Thanks again for being here. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you. <laughs>